We're glad all of you are here with us tonight. Good to have fellowship in the truth, be fellow helpers to the truth, as John said. Amen. We welcome those who are on live stream also. We're always happy to have you join with us. Tonight we'll be our 58th lesson in Genesis. We've covered a lot of ground, and I've explained why we have done this. I'll do it again because it's not my custom to whistle through the text this rapidly. But it's because of the uh, nature of the book of Genesis. It's a book that's developing a perspective in uh, God's people, <coughs> teaching us about valid beginnings. Mm -hmm. I keep track of all the firsts in Genesis, and occasionally I print them out at the end of these lessons. We're well over 300 at this point here. This is going to cover Jacob's journey to Bethel, where God appears to him. We're going to actually go through the entire 29th chapter, uh, 29 verses of this chapter. And God said unto Jacob, now I want you to notice to go through here that in Genesis, God only had to say something once. <clears throat> See, that's kind of strange to folk in the 20th century, but God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. Let us rise, and go up unto Bethel. I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings, which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which is at which is by Shechem. And they journeyed. And the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did pursue after the they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all his people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the name called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel, Bethel under an oak, and the name of it is called Elon Bacchus. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came to when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. As he appeared to him and he blessed him, came out and he blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave unto Abraham and to Isaac I give to thee, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in, that, in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. He poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. 
and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. It came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, as she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went in and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padanaram. And Jacob came unto Isaac his father into Mamre, under the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. The days of Isaac were an hundred and four score years. <clears throat> and Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of years, full of days, and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Now, I've mentioned this before, but I want to mention it again because I don't really hear anybody else saying this. Maybe they are, but and it's very important to pick up on this, how God reports the record of people. I will tell you up front that today's Christian ministers, virtually all of them, do a terrible job of reporting the people that are in the Bible. Because they don't know what I'm going to tell you now. Once you, you know it already, but I'm going to mention it again. How God analyzes people's lives. <clears throat> men are never assessed with the context of other within the context of other men. Yeah. Not in Scripture. They're always assessed in reference to their connection with God. Yeah. Now, let me give an example here. I'm not going to read all these texts. You should be familiar with them. Now, Adam lived to be 930 years old. Uh, that make a, If he wrote a bibliography in our day, it'd be a, like a library. I know people that haven't lived very long at all. They write a bibliography, a great big fat book, and it's like fat is the emphasis of it. It's gotten a lot of fat. Here's, now, here's what God told us about Adam. He told us about his creation. He told us how he named all the animals, and he named them appropriately because they kept the names he gave them. He told us how God gave him a wife. He told us extensive, the most extensive record is Adam's sin, his cursing, and his expulsion from the garden. That's the most that you know about Adam. He also tells you that he begat Cain and Abel. Then for 800 years of his life, it says he begat many sons and daughters. That's all. You have no idea. You have no idea who it was. We know that he begat Seth after his own image when he was 130. From zero to 130, all you know is what happened in the garden. That's all you know about Adam for 130 years. I'm showing you now how God reports, how God assesses your life. You've got to pick up on this.
It's the, and then we read that Adam died at 930. Mm -hmm. The number of people living simultaneously before Noah were, is quite phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Adam lived up to, up to, up to Noah's father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of things were known. Mm -hmm. The whole world knew about Adam's transgression. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. and after Noah, the whole world knew about the flood. Mm -hmm. So this hullabaloo about some nations have never heard and so on, this is not the truth. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. This is not the truth. Mm -hmm. Aside from the gospel, Paul says in Colossians, he says the whole, every creature under heaven heard the gospel midway through the first century. It's what he said. Uh -huh. uh, the Holy Spirit moved him to say it. Amen. But the impact of Adam, the impact he had this is taught. For instance, Adam owns the transgression. Whatever you think of original, what men call original sin, and they banter around about it, sin is called Adam's transgression. You see, you die because Adam sinned. That's the doctrine of Scripture. We learned that Adam was a type of Christ. One stands for all. You run the impact of his sin is delineated in Romans 5.15. You couldn't say these things if you had an elaborate, extensive record of, it, of Adam's life. Through the offense of one, many are dead. Impact number two, Romans 5.16. One that sinned, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. So ever, this is what it says, brother. We don't have to debate some kind of crazy theology. The race is condemned because Adam sinned. That's what it says. Impact number three, by one man's offense, sin reigned. This is a doctrine now. This is the apostolic doctrine we're talking about. Impact number four, by the offense of one, judgment came on all men. Romans 5, 19, by, this, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So people say, are we born sinners? You know, and they argue about it. A bunch of empty-headed people. Many were made sinners because one man sinned. Amen. Impact number six, in Adam all die. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Man, Adam was made a living soul. So you may think it's innocent to teach or believe evolution. You may think that's innocent. The church is very sloppy about handling evolution, let me tell you. A lot of them have theistic evolution. He was made a living soul. Adam was from the earth, earthy. That was his start. From the earth, earthy. And Adam was first formed, then Eve... And Adam was not deceived. That's, right. mm -hmm. yeah. That's all is revealed about Adam. There it is. Now some have juvenilely said, what I like about the Bible is it gives both sides of the people. It shows the people with all their warts and all their faults. That's what I like about the Bible. That's not what I like about the Bible. I'm not angry because God did it, but this is not something to like. But that everybody isn't, we don't see a bad side of everybody in the Bible. I give you 39 people here, I list them out here, that nothing wrong is said about them. Nothing bad is said about them. No sin is credited to any of these people I listed here. So God doesn't show the good and the bad of everybody. He didn't show the good and bad of... Uh, Melchizedek, see. Yeah. Someone might say, well, I'll tell you everybody's a sinner. Moses is a sinner just like Pharaoh. You don't ever read something like that in the Bible. Yeah, that's right. Moses was a sinner just like Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. No, he wasn't just like Pharaoh at all. That's right. Moses was raised up to deliver. Yeah. Pharaoh was raised up to condemn. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Make an example out of him so you'd know 
what God thinks about people that refuse him. He raised up Pharaoh as an exhibit. Now, what's true about the fathers, fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He did not raise these up to establish them as sinners, even though they were sinners. They, Jesus had to die for them, too. But that's not why there are records in the Bible to show us how they say that. Preachers that point to, any, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they say, look at what he did. Look at what Jacob, that old deceiver. God never said that. I'm sorry, God never said that. No, I'm not sorry either. God never said that. He didn't raise them up as examples of sinners. He raised these people up as examples of faith, what faith does, and what people who believe in God do. He set the stage for learning that God calls, chooses, directs, leads... <laughs> You can't read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and place a big stress on, excuse me, free will. When you read about them, you're thinking about God's will. Amen. God called every one of them. God chose every one of them. God used every one of them for a purpose. So when we read these records in Scripture, you really got to pick up on this. God has given no man the liberty of critiquing who he didn't critique. Amen. If God didn't point out a person in Scripture, point out their failures, it doesn't mean they didn't have any. It means that's not how God wants them to re be remembered. Amen. And when I think of what's been said about Jacob, that I personally have heard, it makes me cringe at what's going to happen at the Day of Judgment. Yeah. When God's going to face them with this, square out. Mm -hmm. I told you what I thought about Jacob, and you told everybody what you thought about Jacob, and they were not the same thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, now having that brief introduction, we'll get into the text here. I'm, I'm going to keep on going, kind of going over that because very few people see it, and it you got to battle through a lot of theological garbage to get hold of get hold of that God said to Jacob go arise up rise go up to Bethel and dwell there or live there now this think of what's happened up to this point Jacob's only daughter's been molested his sons have went out and killed every male in the city of Shechem. Mm -hmm. Great burden to his soul. He had to confront Esau. He thought it was going to be a bad experience, but it wasn't. Yeah. This would have left some people emotionally exhausted. They wouldn't be able to be very attentive. I've seen it in people. I see it in myself sometimes. You get kind of cast down. It kind of affects your hearing. Uh -huh. It's like things pass you by because you're burdened. Well, you think how you'd have been burdened if you'd have had to, to have the things Jacob did that your your, man, your employer changed your wages ten times. Tried to cheat you out of everything. See, if anybody could be like emotionally spent and not able to respond, it would have been Jacob. But that's not the way he was. His life was managed by the Lord, see? That's the secret of this. His life was managed by the Lord. Jacob saw it, mm -hmm. and when he saw it, he'd acknowledge it. He'd confess it. God is with me. Uh -huh. God was with me in the way he'd, he'd confess it. He'd asked God when he was afraid of Esau. He asked, deliver me from my brother Esau because I'm afraid. And God, so God did. He delivered him. Now having mercy on Jacob, the Lord's going to speak to him not leaving it up to Jacob to figure out what's next, what should I do next. Let me check the manual of human conduct and see what I should do next. It'll, it'll, in a sense, it may surprise you, but if you actually do 
yield yourself to God. You, like you really get this done. It'll surprise you how life is simplified. Yeah. You'll kind of know what to do and when to do it. You maybe hard to explain it, to, especially to some Babylonian. It may be difficult to explain it, but so you don't have to. Hear it's being lived out. She's being lived out in Jacob. Get up now. This is God. Get up now. <coughs> Go to Bethel. Now, the patriarchs were noted, and build an altar. Go there and build an altar. Build an altar when you get there. Not, not find an altar, because there have been a couple built there already. Not find an altar. Not, not find a natural collection of stones that will make for a good altar. Build one. Build an altar. Now, patriarchs, they were noted for building altars. I said building them. Abraham first arrived in Canaan. He built an altar, Genesis 12, 7. Later, when he relocated near Bethel, which was on the west, he, he built another altar unto the Lord. When he came to Hebron, he once again built an altar. Then on the mountain where God told him to offer up Isaac, he built an altar up there. When God appeared to Isaac in Beersheba, Isaac built an altar there. When Jacob was on his way to Padanaram and had a vision of the ladder reaching up into heaven, he built an altar. He poured oil on a pillar and sanctified the place. Jacob bought a piece of land from Hamar. Hamar. He erected an altar. See, I'm showing you that there was a, there was a kind of a, there was a God consciousness in these men that still challenges people. There is so much distraction in people's lives. That they try, people try to come up with some kind of a system to make them think about God. <laughs> That's not how these people did. These people actually did live for God. Yeah. When God called them, they attached a tremendous significance yes, to the fact that they were called. Now today, people debate about calling and choosing, yeah. and so yeah. they debate about it. They, yeah. they debate about it, and the result is hardly anybody believes it. Yeah. That God does it, but these men, they didn't have these kind of influences. <laughs> they were so God conscious that they moved someplace, they built an altar yeah. to God, as it were, dedicating the place. Now, there's a certain freshness that is to characterize our recollections. See, these altars, it was a visible replication of some, that something happened there. It's good to have holy recollections. How, what kind of holy recollections do you have? Do you, do you like remember when you first believed the gospel? Amen. Do you remember when some certain insights, you, you saw it clearer all of a sudden? Did, did, you, did you raise an altar so you could remember that sort of thing? These men did. Now, here's another thing to note that the tabernacle only had one altar. The temple only had one altar. That was uh, altar was for what God did. And there's a, there is a sense in which we have one altar. We don't build one. But those, that one altar has to do with what God did in redeeming us. There's one altar. We don't build an altar there. But in thanks for thanksgiving and for sanctification and for holy remembrances, we make provision in our life to remember. Yeah. One of the best ordinances is the Lord's table. It's a table of remembrance. So it's like an altar. It's erected to, rem to remember. Amen. See, people, they remember birthdays. They remember wedding anniversaries. They remember the end of the war. They remember all kind of things, remembrances. But yeah. see, this thing about remembering what God did is kind of taking a back seat. God said, build, to build an altar where I appeared unto thee. Uh, that was 20 years before this. That was at least 20 years before this. Where I appeared unto thee. When you were running away from Esau. Remember, remember that? Remember that? Remember when you met Esau last? He ran and met you and fell on your neck and wept. And you held, 
And you were so glad to remember, remember when you were fleeing from him? <laughs> Maybe you can remember when you were fleeing from guilt and trying to, you know, under oppression of some kind. And now, oh, glory to God, you've had some access to God. And you're, yeah, build an altar there. Remember, I appeared to thee then, as when God told him his seed would be as a dust of the earth. He didn't have any children at that time. Your offspring will spread, he said, up to the west and east and north and south. You're going to permeate the whole area. In you and your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'll keep you, Jacob. I'll keep you in all places you go. Now I'll bring you back to Canaan. He told him all this when he first went there. And I'll not leave you till I've done everything I said I was going to do. That's what he told Jacob the first time he was at this place he is now. So that's where I want you to go, Jacob. So Jacob knows what to do. Boy, he knows what to do. He calls the household together. There's a lot of them. There's uh, Rachel and Joseph. And there's... Uh, Leah and Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah. And there's Bilhah and Dan and Naphtali and Zilpah and Gad and Asher. And then there's all those wives, some Shechem that the boys captured and took into captivity. You haven't forgot about them, I trust. So there's a lot of people. Now, he didn't know about everybody being able to kind of do what they want and all that. This. Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, you're traveling with me, this is what you got to do. <clears throat> Put away your strange gods. You got to get rid of them right now. I mean, what would happen if this was a requirement for living in your house? You had to say, look, you're going to live here. You can't have strange gods. Mm -hmm. You can't be worshiping something else like the unrighteous mammon. Uh, you, like you can't be doing it. Period. That's just it. Amen. Let's get the strange gods. Let's, let's gather up all that lousy music you got in the house. Let's gather it up and we're going to scrap it. Go to the bookshelves, find all that stuff. We're going to scrap it. This is what this kind of thing he did. This is in our language. This is what we do. You say, well, I don't, I don't feel free doing that because they spent a lot of money. Well, just learn from Jacob. He's going to meet God, and he knows, hey, I can't have, <laughs> I can't come into God's presence and there'll be idols in my house. Gather them all up. Everybody get them. Actually, that was requ Moses required something like that from Israel when they were to confront God at the giving of the law. Mm -hmm. He told all the Israelites, he said, sanctify them, oh, Moses to tell people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. Remember, they were traveling through a desert. You yeah. well, forget that. Wash their clothes. Be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Someone says, well, God doesn't care what you wear. Well, don't tell that to Moses. Yeah, right. Don't tell that to Jacob. God didn't say, that's not necessary, Jacob. I mean, it's just not necessary. They come from a bad background. They, let's be patient. Let, it, let them work these things out. See, you're being introduced to the real God here and what it really means to trust God. Put away the strange gods. Strange gods are gods that are no gods at all. They don't fit in what God's doing. There are gods, false gods, they're intellectual gods. They don't fit in with what God's doing. They don't appropriately describe God. They're another God. Someone yeah. says, well, God can never love you less. That's not, that's not the real God. That's their God. That's the God they worship. That's not a God we worship. Uh -huh. Amen. The history of Israel. How could you read the history of Israel and say such a dumb thing as that? Yeah. Mm. He told them, I'm going to forsake you. Yeah. I'm not going to receive you anymore. 
I don't, I'm not going to receive your praise. Get your noise and your songs out of my hearing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Has God said that? Amen. See, there's been a there's been a loss of awareness of God. People yeah. pretend they go to church and they pretend. Uh-huh. Almost all these praise services that I've seen, they're pretentious. They're not. They're not real. I can tell they aren't because they can turn them off. Poof. Boy, they can jump and leap and shout, yeah. and they turn it off. As soon as the preaching starts, they turn it off. Yeah. What's that mean? It means it's not real. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's just a real thing. But Jacob knew. When we, when we confront God, when I, I'm going to confront him, but you're my household. Yeah. There can't be strange gods in the house Amen. when I come there. Put them away. Get rid of them. And, and, uh, you know, John said, after he told us that there's a means that's been appointed to us to know of the true God. As in 1 John 5, 20. 20, We know the Son of God is come. That is, he came and he's here to stay. You know, the Son of God has come and that he is teaching us about the that we might know him that is true. We are in him that is true. This is the true God. And the last verse says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, he wasn't talking about idols of Baal or Dionysius or Diana of the Ephesians. He, he wasn't talking about those. He was talking about theological gods misconceptions of God that are idols. They're really not God at all. It isn't that these false prophets have misrepresented God. They're talking about another God. you, you got to see this. Just the same as some people in Corinth and Galatia had given into another Jesus and another gospel and another spirit. You know, it wasn't the real thing. Paul knew it wasn't, and you should know it isn't, yeah. because it couldn't produce the effects yeah. Amen. that the gospel produces. That's the right. thing that Jesus produces isn't being produced in the modern church. Now, a person's really got to be blind not to see this, but it's not being produced. Now, you're shut up to one or two things. Either Jesus has quit working, or this is another Jesus. Yeah. Idols, get them out of the house. Jesus said, you know, come to me. But first, uh, Matthew eleven twenty seven, he said, No man knows who the Father is, who the Son is, but the Father, and who the Father is, but the Son. No, nobody knows who God is except me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And the next verse says, Come. Unto me, all you that are heavy laden, mm-hmm. and learn from me. Amen. I'll teach you this. Yeah. True God. It's possible for a person to be serving an untrue God. Yeah. And you assess yourself. If you've thrown yourself, if you really mm-hmm. have given yourself to what you think is true, mm-hmm. and it's left you the same way as you were before, then it's not a true God. It's not a true Christ. And it's, no one else can assess this for you. You've got you to do this yourself. So put away your strange gods and, and now be clean. Be clean. Make yourselves clean. Purify yourselves. Some versions read, wash yourselves until you are ritually clean. That's the good, new, good God's Word Bible. Contemporary English version said, make yourself acceptable to worship God. He's not talking about a ritual. There was ceremonial washing under the law, but this is a long time before the law, nearly 500 years. And he's not talking about a ritual. Be clean. Just like Israel at Mount Sinai, take a bath. That's what he, that's what he told them. And wash your clothes. Because you're coming before God. So well, I don't, that doesn't make much sense to me. Well, you just be thankful you weren't living back then. 
Because if it didn't make sense to you back then, you were really you were in real trouble. Yeah. All of this points out that the very concept of worship remained in a very rudimentary form. So it was all mostly external. Because the knowledge of God is very sparse. They didn't have much knowledge about God at all. God hadn't, hadn't said one solitary word up to this point. He had not said one solitary word about eternity or the world to come or the day of judgment or something about the day to do with after you died. And nothing said about that at all. They didn't know anything about this. Yeah, the, the boys probably thought that they taken all this stuff with them from this town, the women and was going to be an advantage, but look at what they look what they brought in. That's yeah. right. Amen. Got a lot of bad stuff in the house. That's yeah. right. Be clean now. And um, now um, the purity is required in Jesus. The scripture says, "Don't touch the unclean thing." You say, "What is the unclean thing?" Well, that's that's your work to find out. That's part of working out your salvation. It's not finding the book that defines it. Yeah. That's part of what you're to do. Find out what's unclean. Don't touch it. And we're told that the unclean, whoever's unclean, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. That's Ephesians 5.5. 5. So whatever unclean means, uh, you don't want to be unclean. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let's cleanse ourselves. See? Of all filthiness of flesh and spirit. And uh, change your garments now. Change your garments. See, now there was special clothing in the scripture. There was clothing for working and clothing for sleeping and mourning apparel and a widow's garment. And put on appropriate apparel to, for traveling. We're going to be on the road now. Change your clothes. Actually, we're told the same thing. Change your clothes now. Yeah. Let your loins be girt about, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand be so that you can eat the Passover with haste. He told Israel that. Yeah. He tells us, be clothed with humility now. Let's have a change of clothes. Yeah. The prophet said, I'm going to give you a change of raiment. Mm -hmm. Zechariah 3, 4. Isaiah talked about a garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness, put on some, put on some new garments. Believers are exhorted, put on the armor of light, change your clothes. Put on the new man, change your clothes. Put on the whole armor of God, so forth. Change your clothes. I like this example of the spirit of heaviness, and and running, you have to get the lightest material that you can get your clothes made out of as possible, so that it adds quickness so there's less weighing you down. Mm -hmm. I know that I wouldn't try to run in a three-piece suit mm -hmm. because that's not what it's made for. Yeah. There are specific mm -hmm. clothing. There's even shoes and socks made for running mm -hmm. because you have to be able to do it quickly. If you're a slow runner, then you're not going to get the prize. You're not going to get the goal. Mm -hmm. But when we're running the race that is set before us with patience, we have to do everything in a way that we glorify God and walking or dawdling around isn't the way we glorify God. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Kelly Gibbon? Yes. I was also considering with this clothing as well and Pilgrim's Progress when he received the new garment. Yeah. And how <laughs> when he did. came across these, um, the men from the side of the road, the men who came out of the gates, and all these men who came with him that did not receive these clothes, that they, these garments, they stood out to them. Mm -hmm. And they, they wondered at their, his clothing. And how we put on these garments, and the men of the world, they see these garments mm -hmm. on us. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. This is what God, he said, well, I'm going to build an altar. He tells the crew, I'm going to build an altar. God told him to build an altar. I'm going to build an altar now. Now, there's this immediacy of obedience to God. Is accident at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I give some text here. I won't read them. What God told them to do, then they obeyed it. When God tell them to do something, they did it. Offer Isaac, he did it. Leave Ur, he did it. Leave Haran, he did it. Go down to Egypt, he did it. Don't go down to Egypt, he did it. Stay in Gerar, he did it. 
See, everything God told them to do, they did. Amen. Always be suspicious of a religion that allows you not to do what God said. Now, there's a God. Now, listen to me. There's a God that people are presenting that makes such people comfortable. We learn from this, these accounts, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that people that have faith obey God. People that don't obey God don't have faith. Those who are chosen by God obey God. Abraham was chosen so forth. The only exception of that that I know of is Judas. And he was chosen for another purpose. Those who truly know God will obey him. We learn that. Those who are duly appointed leaders obey God, whose faith follow. And he tells his whole household, this is the God who who answered me in the day of my distress. And it was with me in the way which I went. He was saying, this makes a lot of sense to me to build this altar like he said. God's been good to me. Amen. Hasn't he been good to you? Amen. You want to assess it? Yes. God's been good to me. Been good to me, I can tell you. Yeah. Been good to me. If you're going to have someone say, well, why did God do that? You'll, have to, you'll never hear those words out of my mouth. He's done been too good to me. <laughs> but see, why? The kind of why he's been so good. Yeah. yeah. See that he's been. He he heard me in the day of my distress. He heard me. See, all God has to do is hear you, and then he'll resolve the problem. If you can get God's attention, he'll do something. Of course, that's sometimes it's not as easy as it as it sounds. Well, the whole household did what he said. They gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their, all their hands. They had them. They had them in the tents somewhere. They were hidden away. They gave them all to Jacob. The women who born children to Jacob, Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah, together with his servants, the wives taken captive, all the boys, any gods that were among any of them, they gave them to Jacob. Just like at Ephesus, they turned in all their books yeah. of curious arts. They had a book burning. Oh, that'd be Amen. good. Wouldn't that be good to have an announcement in the paper? So-and-so is having a book burning. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they did in Ephesus. Now, you want to do pick up on that Jacob's sensitivity to God. And it says in a, they gave him their earrings, too. Now, these weren't um, ordinary earrings because earrings just to, uh, were not pictured as wrong. Remember when uh, Abraham's servant went to get a wife for Isaac, he gave Rebecca a gold earring, a real expensive earring. When the various materials were gathered for the building of the tabernacle, the women gave their earrings for it. At the inclusion of Job's trial, each of his friends gave him a gold earring. God said of the manner in which he raised up Israel, he said, I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thy ears. See, so it's just not the earrings. Or, some people think they're wrong. Yeah. Uh-huh. But uh, you've got to explain why God gave Israel some earrings. These earrings were special earrings associated with idolatry. Yeah. And those who worship false gods still have jewelry yeah. that's tied to their right. religion. Uh-huh. When I was in India one time, we had a lot of mass baptism. Meetings were attended by 20,000 people at one time, three times a day. I don't know how many we baptized. It was a very very high number and the uh, Indian ministers baptized them well when I a Hindu woman come forward I noticed there's like a ceremony they went through they had uh, uh, they had a garment put around them like a 
while they could remove the garments they had. They had this other garment run that was a little pile of these garments. They had all kind of things to jewels on their faces and then their ears and then their nose. And they removed all of that and put it on a st that stack of clothes. And then that was all taken away and burned. And that was a formal renunciation of Hinduism. If a man came up to the medians from southern India where they have like doctors and professional people, when he went to be baptized, he was a doctor. When he came up, he was a peasant. Because their politics and their religion are merged. And I remembered these incidents back there. See, back in those Oriental countries, even though they worship false gods, everything they do is for their god. Even down to committing suicide. Everything they do is for their god. We saw it in the Second World War, remember the suicide pilots? It was religion. It was their religion. The rise, religion of the rising sun. Everything they do is for their god. Now in this... <laughs> They've upstaged the Christians. They must laugh at Christianity. I, I don't blame it that, at how it's presented the normally because it's not wholehearted. These people back here, God commenced training and educating the people that everything about your life is connected with me. You're not independent in any sense. You're not autonomous in any way. You live for me. When you come before me, you take off everything and pitch it away that doesn't blend well with me. Mm -hmm. this, is how they was, this is how the people raised up. You know, <clears throat> remember when Peter, on the day of Pentecost, this is co conveniently omitted by most people with whom I've been identified. The people were so convicted when Peter preached. He didn't tell them why Jesus died. You, you picked up on this, I'm sure. He didn't tell the people God loved them. You yeah, surely must have picked up on that. He just said, you uh -huh. kill the prince of life. You through the hands of lawless men have crucified and slain the one God raised up from the dead. Boy, he hammered them. And the people said, what shall we do? Yeah. Yeah. And he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that wasn't the last thing he said. Before they were baptized, he told them the promises to you and to your children, those that are far off in his ministry, the Lord our God, God is called. And then the 40th verse says, with many other words, he exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourself from this untoward generation. And after that, they were baptized. I have never heard someone say that at an invitation. Have you? Any of you? Surely someone must have heard it someplace, but I never did. I never heard anybody say that at an invitation. That's what Peter said. You disconnect from this generation. This generation is going to be more tolerable for Sodom than for this generation. That's what Jesus told them. Save yourself from it. See, that's equivalent to these, these people getting ready to meet, meet God. Then God says, as, you, as God, as he that has called you is holy, be holy in all manner of conversation or every, every facet of life, be holy. So they brought everything, uh, everything to him, and he uh, buried it under an oak tree. He had it all together and buried it. Then they commenced their journey. <laughs> it says, as they journeyed, the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. He, Jacob didn't have an army. Esau had an army. Jacob didn't have an army. He had a lot of women, flocks, herds. Looked like they were vulnerable, you know. Looked like they were vulnerable. Here they're marching along. God just sent terror. They were afraid to do anything to these 
<laughs> to these people. Do you believe God can still do that? Amen. Well, we still can. Once you're convinced of it, it just kind of takes the fear of man away from you. As they were journeying, nobody wanted to attack them. Nobody wanted to pursue them. No one desired their women folk or their longings or their flocks or as another fulfillment of a promise God made to Jacob in Genesis 31 3, I will be with thee. There's another fulfillment of it. Many of the ancients sense this that God can restrain people from hurting you. He doesn't always do it. Stephen was still so stoned, you know. <laughs> but he can do this. God restrained Abimelech from defiling Sarah. You remember? Abimelech said, I did, hey, hey, I didn't know she was Sarah. He, she was Abraham's wife. I, did, I didn't touch her. Oh, God says, I know you didn't. I didn't let you touch her. He delivered them from Egypt so that the Egyptians were glad to see him go and gave them all they needed to get out. And God told Israel, the people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. See, fear and dread shall fall upon them. Your enemies will be scared. <laughs> scared. Now the time could come when like a president would be afraid to do what our president's doing. Yeah, some people can't be won by love. They've got to be won by fear. Yeah. Now that's how he cared for them when they went. Again, God promised Israel, Exodus 23, 27, I will send my fear before you. So just like a, as they were proceeding, every place they went, people were afraid of them. Before they entered the promised land, Moses reminded the people, There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land. Now this, this is how God works. Before he gives over new territory to you, he'll send fear upon those that are occupying that territory. They'll be afraid to interfere with you. Does God still do that? Well, is God still God or isn't he? Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's time for the church to get acquainted with God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The early church was so protected by God that no one dared join themselves to them. Uh -huh. After that incident of Ananias and Sapphira, Amen. if they'd have had a billboard, you know, they'd have put out there, now liars drop dead during service. And that word got around what happened in Ananias and Sapphira, and all they did, they overstated their offering. That's all they did, they just overstated, which has done a lot. They just overstated their offering. It says no man dare join himself to them. Don't go down there. That's one way to keep the church clean. Be so holy, God will put the fear and dread. Yes, brother. Not afraid to attack us because we're not walking with God as a nation. That's exactly it. That's exactly it, brother. If brother. our nation was right with God, they'd be afraid to do anything. Yeah. You're exactly right. Care of that. You're yeah. exactly right. Mm -hmm. We can stir one another up because there can be that holy. If we get the remnant together, yeah. see people are out there trying to get everybody. But the to me, the focus of attention has got to be on the remnant of God's people to get them built up and encouraged in the Lord and their faith strong so we're united yeah. even, though we're even though we're dispersed. Keep in mind that Jacob had a lot of flocks and herds, a great number of women that would attract the attention of most uh, enemies. Well, Jacob finally came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel. Luz was his previous name. It was a Canaanitish city near the site of Bethel. That's where Jacob had raised up stones when he saw the ladder reached up into heaven. He'd named the place Bethel. See, of old time, when God appeared to somebody or God blessed somebody or did something extraordinary, they'd give a name to that 
to that place and sanctify the memory of it. And I give you the names of some things, places they named. See, this shows the prominence of God in their lives. They didn't like name them after their children. They named them after what God did for them there. See, their lives were God-centered. That's what you want to see. We talk about God-centered lives most of the time in Christianity, if I may use that term. But it's what ought to be. We're all, people always talk about what ought to be, not what it is. We're reading here what was. This is what they actually did. Their lives were centered uh, in God. So they named places. Well, there, I, there are some places in my life that I've associated with certain blessings or certain places. That at the time I was there, some something broke through to my spirit or some great strength I received from God. I remember that there's a song that I remember the time and I remember the place. And there's places like that. Sanctified. Well, these, these holy men, they, uh, they did that. But everything wasn't pleasant. Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, dies. Now, what Rebecca was doing there, I don't know, and I've not been satisfied with any of the explanations of the commentators. <laughs> she was Rebecca's nurse, and Rebecca was, wasn't there. What was Deborah doing there? I don't know. Some... Some people say they sent her out to meet him. I just have to tell you, I don't know why she was there. But she died, and she must have been very, very old at this time. She was a nurse of Rebecca when, when, when she was born, and she was given to her when she went back to be with Isaac. So Deborah died, and she was buried beneath, beneath Bethel under an oak. And they call the name of the place Alan Bacoth, which means Oak of Weeping, like it was a sad experience to see her go. I'm showing you how much grief and sadness Jacob experienced, yet he kept on yeah, kept on going. Then after this, after Rebecca dies, God appears unto Jacob again when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. Prior to the journey, God appeared to Jacob, told him, go to Bethel. And then Jacob ordered his strange gods removed and all that. God himself prepared. And God appears to him again as he, as he was on his way. He appeared to him as he was on his way. That's the idea. Which is God's manner of doing things. You... It's in the process of your obedience that you hear from God and are led and directed by God. That's, that's the framework yeah. of, how you're, of how you're blessed and led by God. If you're recalcitrant and you buck against, the, buck against God and hesitate and are slow of heart, and, now God isn't going to lead you. He's not going to put a hook in your nose and drag you into glory. This isn't the way it works. At all, and some people's lack of progress is owing to the spirit they have. They have a withdrawing type spirit, but it wasn't so with uh, with Jacob. So God appeared to him again to build him up. You can kind of, you can kind of see what he's doing here, and all it says he blessed him. What, what was involved there, I don't know, but when God blesses, I mean, it's a yeah. blessing. Anyone who's blessed by God is made better yeah. because of it. Amen. They're given certain advantages by God yeah. that make them equal to life. God said to him, thy name is, is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. He said, well, I, well, he was named Israel before by that angel he wrestled with. No, no, no. The angel said, your name shall be Jacob. Mm -hmm. Read back. He said, you shall, you shall be Jacob. Now, the name was formally given by God. He gave him a new name. It was the mouth of the Lord shall name. So I said, yeah. and that, he took place. What that angel promised came to pass. Your name is 
Israel, and from this point on, he's called Israel most of the time. So there's a principle fulfilled that Isaiah talked about. Thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. This tells us that a new name is not owing to a new set of habits that you've adopted. Huh? Yeah. A new name is owing to what God has done. Amen. That's right. A new nature, you received a new nature not because of what you did, mm -hmm. but because of what God did. Amen. See, anything new is new because of what God did, mm -hmm. not because of what you did. To be sure, you did some things, but it wasn't enough to be made new. Yeah. <laughs> So the validity of a new name is owing to the work of God. And then God reaffirms the covenant to Jacob that he made with Abraham and with Isaac. He told him about he's gonna, his seed is going to multiply. I'm going to give this land to them. And he reaffirmed the covenant he made with Abraham. And then he told him, be fruitful and multiply now. Be fruitful and multiply. Put these experiences you've had, put them behind you now. Be fruitful, multiply. Same word is delivered to the creatures that were created out of water. All of the fish and the whales and the birds were created out of the water. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the water and fill the sky. And again, Adam and Eve were told, be fruitful and multiply. And the animals that he took with him, were, he told them that they would be, be fruitful and multiply. And the sons of Noah and Noah, they were told, be fruitful and multiply. So this is a commandment accompanied by divine power. Just as surely as when he said to the fish and the birds, be fruitful and multiply, that was a prelude to God doing it. It's the same thing here. Amen. Yep. This is not like a stewardship you're charged with doing this. This is what those that are belong to God do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fruitful and multiply. Amen. You see, that was a command. See, an effective command. Well, they did multiply. He told them, he said, you'll be a, a nation and a company of nations shall be of the, at the time, it was just 12 sons and a daughter. Yeah. That, and for before that, there was hardly anybody. It was Isaac. He was a loner. Jacob, he was a loner. Didn't have any seed. Well, they did multiply. They were a, they were a, a nation comprised of nations. Now, they, when they took account of the uh, people, they would count the men of war from 20 years and older that were fit to fight in war. So the young ones weren't counted and the old ones that weren't able to fight, they weren't counted. And I give a, the number of the tribes at Sinai. Mm -hmm. There were 603,550 young men above 20 that were fit for war. 603,550. Well, all of those men died off in the wilderness, but when they recounted, there were 601,000 and something, so they had a lot of births out there in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were fruitful and multiplied in the wilderness. Uh, yeah. See, they were fruitful and multiplied in Egypt, yeah. right? Yeah. Egypt was the incubator. Yeah. That's where they multiplied. Uh -huh. And in the wilderness, while one generation is dying off, another generation is coming up. Amen. Be fruitful and multiply. I'm going to give this land to you. This is the uh, seventh time God's made this commitment. He made it four times to Abraham, once to Isaac, and twice to Jacob. He made that promise, this land. There, it didn't look like it at all, but it, he gave it to him. It was because the promise hadn't yet been fulfilled, it had to be repeated because it wasn't fulfilled yet. This isn't the way it is with the new covenant with the promises given to us. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have the new covenant reread to us. 
over and over and over. See, say why not? Because our situation is different. Mm -hmm. We have some. We're tasting of some of the goods from the other side. Amen. We're not sustained by the repeat of the promise necessarily. Mm -hmm. We are sustained by participating yes. in the divine nature and receiving goods from the other side. See, our situation is different. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. God said, it's only recorded one time in the apostolic writings, two, well, two times in Hebrews. I'll put my laws into their minds. I'll write my laws in their hearts. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. All shall know me from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful to their unrighteousnesses. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's the covenant. That's the words of the covenant spelled out in Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10. You see that? Now some people, listen brethren, a lot of Christian people have never yet heard those words. Yeah, yeah. Amen. I know now, when I used to do a lot of preaching at different churches, I'd ask about this. And most of the people had never heard these words one time. They didn't remember it anyway. A point was never made of it. And they weren't living proper either. Once you hear these words, there's something about it that they stick with you. If you walk in the Spirit and live by faith, these covenantal promises, you actually experience them where Abram, Isaac, and Jacob didn't experience it. See? They, were, they walked in the land as strangers and had to buy a plot to bury their dead. I mean, it wasn't exactly like us now. Then after God is through talking with them, he went up from him. says he went up from him when he finished Exactly the same language when he talked with Abram about the sparing of the righteous and uh, not destroying the righteous with the wicked. Said so when God finished talking with Abram, he went up. <laughs> Just like when Jesus was done finishing with talking to the disciples, he went up. <laughs> and then the angel said, Don't, he's coming back. And he built Jacob. Oh, he didn't want to forget this place. He set up a pillar. Well, the first time he was here, he set up a pillar. Remember, he anointed it. First time he was here, he set up another pillar. Hey, we're not going to, we're not going to re anoint the old pillar. We're going to set up a new pillar. Yeah, amen. New pillar. And he, he anointed it with a drink offering. That's the first time in the Bible a drink offering is mentioned. This is it. A drink offering, then he poured oil on it. It's like the drink offering prepared it for the mm -hmm. sanctifying oil. You say, well, why would a man do something like that? This had a way of nailing this experience in his conscience. Yeah. Uh -huh. He took some action so I will not easily forget hmm. what's taking place here. Now to me, this is what should happen at the Lord's table. Every time we sit here, we should rivet this thing in our minds so it's not anointed and pour oil on it, so to speak. Sanctify the, the remembrance of it. The drink makes me think of the symbol of the satisfying effect that this had for him. That's good. The drink satisfies him. That's good. Do you remember one time Paul... Did the Philippians said he poured himself in a libation or a drink offering? Mm -hmm. He himself was the drink offering. Mm -hmm. upon, the, upon their faith, he said. Quite a thing to see. Yes, that's good about this satisfaction. The water is... Uh, well, we're still not over with difficult experiences. As they journeyed on from Bethel, they were not far from... Ephrath, which was Bethlehem, that's Bethlehem. And Rachel, she starts travailing with very difficult labor. The midwife, we don't know who it was. We know who it wasn't. It wasn't Deborah. We know that. Said, uh, fear not. We'll just lose the baby. You'll be okay. Oh. That's a 20th century mentality, but that's not how they... <laughs> You'll bear this son also. 
fear not. So this is our addition. This is the wife he loved. This was his, you might say, favorite wife. She's the first one to die. Just a little way from Bethlehem, Joseph and Mary made it. Right? Joseph and Mary make a long, about 70-mile journey, and they made it before Mary gave birth, but they, <coughs> Jacob and Rachel didn't make it. Something is reported about her. It came to pass as her soul was departing. Yeah. I've seen some people's souls depart. I didn't see the soul depart, but I've seen when that took place. The soul. The body thought the spirit is dead being alone. This is what happened. As her soul was departing, and he asked for she died. In other words, this out of body experience, I I went to heaven or I went to hell or what I don't believe those. You can make up your own mind what you think about them, but I think they're one hundred percent baloney. As her soul was departing, that she called his name Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. <laughs> like saying, what a way to have to die. Giving birth to my son. I wanted a son. I give my birth to a son and I die in the process. Benoni. Jacob, he's right on up. He named him Benjamin. Son of my right hand. He's going to break great joy. Amen. Joy to me. Well, we're still a lot uh, down with some trouble. See, if you think that living for the Lord is trouble free, well. Yeah. So they journeyed on, and Jacob was spread out his headquarters around the Tower of Eder, Eder which is somewhere around Bethlehem and Jerusalem in that general, general area. And his son Reuben lays with his with Bilhah, his concubine, his firstborn. Now you just have to think now how this would affect you. Jacob was a man. He had he had all these bad experiences. See, here's boy, here's one. My son lay with my concubine. The one that gave birth to two of his brothers. Yeah. He lay with her. All it says is, about it, Israel heard it. Yeah. Now see, sensitive souls, they don't have to have any further comment. They know. Yeah. This was a heartbreaking, heart-rending experience. I don't know what he did, but he mentioned it when he was, when he was dying. Yeah. Jacob yeah. mentioned this. That's right. And Reuben lost the firstborn rights because of this incident, and they passed on to Joseph. Then, he, then the text names the um, sons of Jacob, which were 12. And then Jacob finally makes it back to Isaac, his father. Isaac stayed alive for this final moment. He's 180 years old. See, he outlived his dad for five years. Abraham was 175 when he died. So Isaac lived five years longer than his father did, 180 years. He gave up the ghost. That's another way of saying his, his spirit departed, soul departed from him. Except he willingly. Yeah. It's as though saying he knew it was time to, yeah. time to gather my feet into my bed. Time my departures come. Yeah. That's something I want to be able to recognize and mm -hmm. myself. The hours come mm -hmm. and depart in peace. Mm -hmm. He gave up the ghost. Some versions say he breathed his last. I like uh, the Amplified Bible says Isaac's spirit departed. I like yeah. like that imagery. 
See, this is the part that was breathed in. Yes, amen. Yeah, now it's breathed out. Yeah, right. yeah. So whatever God gives mm -hmm. goes back. Amen. Even now, down to your talents yes. or down yeah. to your breath. Mm -hmm. What God gives yeah. goes back. And you remember when uh, Abraham died, Ishmael and Isaac buried him together. When Isaac died, Esau and Jacob. Uh, must have been a tender scene. They buried their dad. They weren't enemies this time around. They've been reconciled. Now, this set the stage for the coming redemption. The first is the worst. You learn that from all these. The first is the worst. The last is the best. You learn that from this. We get the old man first, new man second. Adam came first, and the second man came. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a modern-day minister has written a very popular book, said, your best life now. Mm -hmm. Actually, that could only be said of people that are going to hell. That's right. So I've been thinking seriously of writing one, your worst life now. Right. Yes, brethren, believe me, and I tell you this, but this is as bad as it gets right Amen. now. Amen. This is the worst. Your worst experiences are in this world. Amen. The best is yet to come. Amen. Amen. Well, I trust that you gleaned a little from these. Uh, there, I like to think of these records as uh, thought developers. Mm -hmm. They develop your thinking capacity, kind of stretch it a little bit so you're able to think deeper and higher and broader Amen. have a little better working grasp of the things of God and then if you ever wonder whether you've got the right conclusions that they're lived out the the details and the conclusions are lived out in these in these people all right any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight yes as you were talking about this, the best life now, as the famous preacher speaks about, and how how horrible it would be for the for Christians if our best life was now. Oh, yes. It would give us nothing to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. We were having our best life now, having these trials and things, it strengthens us and help us, gives us hope to look forward to what's to come. And I consider, um, I kept considering the saying best comes last and how in our household each of us is assigned to chores we each like to get the chores that we don't really like doing first and then we do our favorite chores last yeah. and how and how that's what we're doing now we're getting we're completing the worst things now yeah. and looking forward to the best things amen yeah. Amen. Yeah. amen yes Anna. Um, you need to be clean for the Lord. Christ is king, so um, you can't be dirty. You need to be clean. You can't just go to a king and be dirty. You need to be clean for the Lord, not just because you want to, but for the Lord. That's right. Very well said, man. Yes, Whenever Jacob went back to Bethel, he revisited a place that he had already made a remembrance of. So this is something that I was considering the people of the Lord can do, is to revisit those yeah. places that we've raised up a remembrance that the Lord has already done a work. Yes. And in that revisitation there, considering those things again, there was an increased blessing. Given. He blessed him again. He blessed him more Amen. than the first time around. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, Brother Jason. You have another thought on that, why the, why the promise is repeated several times that that Abrahamic covenant <coughs> promise yes. is repeated several times I have, a, I have another perspective on this Does, it doesn't it's not different it's just oh, another oh, yeah. perspective you see an illustration here that God's purpose 
is going to keep going. It's, it can't be stopped. That's good. And so, so every every generation, every at certain significant points in Abraham's life, like with Isaac, his faith is tested. He passes the test. The promise is given again. Then, then Isaac comes on the scene. The promise is given to him. Abraham yeah. dies, but the promise doesn't die. That's yeah. right. Amen. So then it passes on to Jacob. Well, it looks it looks pretty shaky for a while there. Yeah. You have this whole thing with Esau and Jacob and everything. But see, the promise continues. Amen. Passes on to Jacob. Now Jacob's life is continuing. Now he's becoming an old man. There's all kinds of challenges. Yeah. We're not we're not even into the Joseph narrative That's yet. Right. Things are going to get real interesting. That's right. Amen. It's going to look like, see, it's the, all these obstacles yeah. Yeah. to God's yeah. blessing continuing, to God's per And every single time in every generation, the promise continues. Amen. And his purpose continues. Amen. And that's a theme that's being established here that nothing can yeah. stop God from doing what he purposes to do. And remember, the, the Abrahamic covenant. That is God's original That's right. purpose. That's right. So in the new yeah. in the New Testament, when Paul preaches the gospel and others too, Peter, they they trace it back. That's right. To Amen. Abraham, That's yeah. right. all the way back to Abraham. Yeah. God's promise, see, continues throughout every generation, Amen. no matter what what kind of obstacles come against it. It breaks through those obstacles and continues on. The only question is, are you going to be a part of the part blessing. Of it, That's yeah. the only question. Very good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In giving the the covenant to each one of the three patriarchs, and instead of just having it passed down from Abraham and told to his sons, but God Himself established yeah. it yeah. in each of those generations. He has narrowed down His work in the earth. To the Jews, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it, with Abraham, he had more than one son. And he was, and so it was confirmed in Isaac. Yeah. It was confirmed to Abraham for Isaac, but then God confirmed it with Isaac. That's right. So that excluded the other sons mm -hmm. of Abraham. Then you have Isaac. He has more than one son, but this is not the. All of them are not the covenant of people. God is choosing a people. He's developing a nation. And so he confirms it with Jacob yeah. and get, changes his name. Now, from that point forward, all of the progeny of Jacob are included. Yeah. So there's there's not this, this exclusion of other influences and other peoples. But rather this, whenever you think about what God is doing in the earth, you know where to look and who to, who to yeah. watch in this and I really was uh, I was I was blessed by by the point you made about God commanding them to be fruitful and multiply mm -hmm. it was like when God said let there be light yeah, that's yeah. Right. he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't telling the light to do something as though it was going to do it he was pronouncing what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. He was pronouncing a blessing. Mm -hmm. And it's just like whenever Balaam says, you know, I've been commanded to bless and I can't reverse it. It's he, God said, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, that was his pronouncement upon That's them. Right. That's what they were going to do. They were yeah. going to be fruitful Amen. and multiply. Amen. Now you come to the new covenant and you see what God has told us in Christ. Mm hmm and so that's, it's not like we're set, like God said this, so now we're going to have to make it happen. This is what God is, th this is his work. Mm -hmm. This is what he is doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whenever he says, be holy as I am holy, he's made us a holy people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And whenever he said, when he, whenever he gave the commandment of life, that's what we do. We live. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Amen. Good you mentioned the hardships that we experience in life here. You pointed out the erroneousness of the state, like our best life now. Well, you could take that and paraphrase a certain verse to say, if this be our best life now, we are of all men most miserable. Most miserable. <laughs> yeah. but because if what's up ahead isn't better, greater than what we experience here, then there is no motivation to run or press on or even fight. Because... 
if you're thinking like this is the best, then like why would you like what what's the point of leaving it? You know, like that's what the gospel says. Come out, separate yourself, move, get away from that. And uh, the thing about it is, it's not just a slight improvement. Like you'll have them, but just not so much. I mean, it's a complete opposite. Like in the Revelations points out, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. Like it points all these things that we experience here on a frequent basis. They're just erased there. And so, with that in view, it is the worst life. Yes, amen. Yes, Tasha. Yeah, I'm thankful for how you um, brought out the difficulties that that Jacob suffered throughout his life. I had never seen seen it that clearly, but it just shows you the constraining power of believing God. Yes, that's right. Amen. When you believe God, you're willing to do whatever Amen. He calls you to do. And we have these patriarchs that were able to look back and see the primitive time in which they lived. They were able to continue and they shaped their lives around yeah. one word that the Lord gave them, or maybe two mm -hmm. words, or a promise, or something that the Lord, it was just very small but they were able to conform their life around these things of the Lord said. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Brother Gibbon? Yes. Um, my sister Gibbon. Tasha just said that the reason that is is because these brethren had faith. Faith, um, Brother Aaron, I think it said on Sunday that faith only needs one word from God. And so that's that's that was their reaction was out of their faith to the Lord. And um, also, um, you uh, said in the lesson that obedience is the prelude to blessing and further revelation. I appreciated that thought because um, I was thinking about a race, how um, through a race, in running the race that we're running, we are obeying God. And in races, there are little stations of water. Mm -hmm. And so as we're running, um, we are obeying the Lord, and there are those blessings along the way and further revelation. So I was thankful mm -hmm. for that. Amen. 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 All right, we'll have a word of prayer now. Our Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for the word you've delivered to us and the life that's in it and the perspective that you provide in it. We're thankful that we do live by every word of God. And we now ask for grace to be consistent in our lives and alert and holy in all manner of demeanor. And to lay hold of this that uh, Brother Jason has said, that your purpose is still being fulfilled. May we be a part of it in Jesus' name. Amen.